An earthquake has struck the main Indonesian island of Java, leaving at least 62 people dead, hundreds injured. According to local officials, U.S. Geological Survey data says the 5.6 magnitude quake struck Kanja town in West Java at a shallow depth of six miles. Videos on social media showed some buildings reduced almost entirely to rubble and debris strewn on streets. Officials warn of possible aftershocks and say the death toll could rise. The area where the quake struck is densely populated and prone to landslides with poorly built houses. Rescuers have been trying to evacuate people from collapsed buildings and managed to save a woman and her baby. West Java Governor Ridwa Kamil confirmed to local media that 56 people had died and more than 700 were injured. He said the numbers of injuries and fatalities are likely to increase because there are a lot of people still trapped at the scene with one area blocked by a landslide. Away from the tragedy still in Indonesia, the country's defense minister has said that his country is committed to the policy of non-alignment with both China and the United States after meeting with his U.S. counterpart in Jakarta. Prabowo Subianto also said Indonesia's planned purchase of F-15 fighter jets was in advanced stages and awaiting final sign-off from the government. The meeting between U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin and Prabowo comes as the U.S. looks to strengthen its relations with countries in the region amid fears over Beijing's growing military presence and possible conflict over Taiwan. On Sunday, China said it is open to a meeting with Austin on the sidelines of a security forum in Cambodia this week in a sign of thawing relations after the country's top leaders met earlier this month. Austin and Chinese Defense Minister Wei Feng will both be in Semri to attend an Association of Southeast Asian Nations Defense Ministerial Meeting. We consider China to be a friendly nation to Indonesia and uh, our way of managing uh, possible misunderstandings, uh, possible uh, differences of opinions in uh, matters of uh, territorial waters, etc. We consider we will be able to resolve them with uh, dialogue, with uh, friendly attitude and friendly, friendly relations. The acquisition of the F-15 uh, certainly increases interoperability. Uh, it enables uh, our ability to share information. And as uh, we, uh, we train on those platforms, uh, we'll train uh, together to uh, make sure that we're using common uh, policies and practices, uh, and I think uh, that will increase the overall capability of whatsoever, uh, overall capability uh, in terms of uh, total uh, capability. So um, I think this platform brings a lot if uh, the leadership decides to, uh, to go that route, and I hope they do. Staying in Asia, U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris attended a forum for the young Filipino women during her visit to Manila today and spoke about the importance of human rights across different cultures and nationalities. Speaking at a U.S. Embassy event, Ms. Harris highlighted the need for understanding basic human rights, which said everyone is entitled to. She's on a three-day visit to the Philippines to improve bilateral ties with Manila and reaffirm the U.S. commitment to the country as a defense partner. She's also expected to visit Palawan Island on Tuesday to meet with civil society groups. And I think it's always important to remember that in the fight for human rights. And then to remember... <laughs> of activists held a rally near the presidential palace in Manila earlier today to protest against U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris's visit to the Southeast Asian 
country. Police rushed to block the protesters from approaching a gate leading to the palace and kept a watchful eye as the activists held their protests a few hundred meters from the intended location. Ms. Harris said today that after meeting the Philippines president, that the relationship between the two countries was long and enduring and American commitment was unwavering. The U.S. Vice President will also reaffirm Washington's support for a 2016 International Tribunal ruling. We also are against the warmongering of the United States for the sake of asserting it's uh, hegemony in this part of the world. We don't want our our country to be used as the uh, springboard or launching pad of the wars of the United States against China or any other country. We want a peaceful Philippines and a peaceful region. Over in the United States, officers are investigating a hit crime in Colorado Springs where a gunman killed at least five people and injured 25 others over the weekend. Police identified the suspect as Anderson Lee Aldrich, a 22-year-old man, and said he used a long rifle. He was taken into police custody shortly after the shooting began and was being treated for injuries. According to authorities, several of the injured were in critical condition being treated at local hospitals. A spokesperson for the city of Colorado Springs uh, said authorities were aware of a 2021 bomb threat involving an individual with the same name and birth date as the suspect, but have not officially confirmed his one and the same. Club Q has been a safe for the LGBTQ community uh, in an area where it hasn't always been easy. It's a place where we can gather and dance and share joy. And of course, there's a lot we don't know about this night's attack. But what we do know is that we awoke this morning in mourning because of this senseless act of evil. And I feel that same pit in my stomach as so many of you today do. A feeling that's sadly all too familiar. There'll be more information in the next days and hours about who or where or why, but ultimately there's no answer to an unspeakable act of evil. It really means we must come together, show our love for one another, and how precious life is, and how no matter who you are or who you love, uh, the Colorado and America welcomes you and protects everyone. Our Washington correspondent Maria Burr joins me now for more. Hi, Maria. Good to see you. I mean, the crime in Colorado, multiple firearms, we understand, were found at the venue. Has police been able to determine the ownership of the weapons? There's a still under investigation as far as the ownership of the weapons. Uh, what we do know is that it appears as if uh, the gunmen that they have identified, um, some of those could be potentially owned by him, but all of the ownership, it looks as if there could have been some ownership by individuals uh, that are not tied to this at this time. So they're trying to really see, was this something bigger than what we actually saw occur? Was this multiple individuals involved in this? And so this will be an ongoing uh, investigation. And I guess that also, um, you know, would you also say that in response to um, the fears that the 2021 bomb threat involving an individual with the same name and same date of birth, has there been a confirmation to that? It is highly unlikely that you're talking about the same name, same birth date, and the same area um, could be someone different, especially when you talk about hate crimes. Typically, when individuals, what we've seen in the past, um, carry out these type of hate crimes, they have tried something before. And so they've almost given like these warning signs um, in the past. And so um, they have not yet had a final confirmation, as you just mentioned, about the firearms that were present. This is going to be a lot more than just a case of a of the actual mass shooting. This is a mass shooting that is tied to hate crime. So there's several different um, units within the police department that are going to have to investigate this. There's the FBI, there's federal agents that will be involved in this process. So this is going to take a little bit longer um, than what we might have seen 
um, in the past few weeks, but unfortunately, we've just seen so many mass shootings here in the United States. Um, President Joe Biden said that Americans cannot and must not tolerate hate um, condemning the violence. But this is a, a, perhaps an area, a Rocky Mountain states, that has a grim history of um, you know, mass violence. The 1999 shooting at Columbine High School, uh, also the 2012 rampage inside a movie theater. Um, do you see a trend somewhere? But what we're seeing is that, unfortunately, um, you, you have communities where people are, you know, dealing with major depression. Uh, they're dealing with a lot of, when you look at the economic environments that exist in some of these communities, when you look at some of the, there's very few um, signifiers that I think a lot of um, analysts are now reviewing to see what is it that is actually creating, as you said, you mentioned just three uh, mass shootings in this one region that will create this sort of a trend. And so what we do know is that isolation is an incubator uh, for this type of mass killings. And so oftentimes isolated communities become larger incubators. Um, and so that is one of the greatest challenges is mental health uh, that the U.S. is going to have to tackle as they look to tackle the issues around gun violence. Obviously, this is a, a, a red flag to Senate um, to the Congress right now as they look to put forward new gun laws in place to obviously mitigate the mass shooting issues, but you're also going to have to address the mental health challenges that exist in the communities. All right. Perhaps away from the Colorado shooting, Maria, um, VP Harris, uh, Kamala Harris is, you know, in Manila today. And then there were some protests, even though uh, she went there with a message, universal human rights. How back home, how are they reacting to her visit? Well, I think that the hope is that we can uh, rekindle the ties in a much stronger way. Um, as we know, the U.S. has been a supporter of Taiwan um, as it relates to China. And I think that one of the questions is going to be, you know, what you're seeing the protests are focusing on. They're focusing on the fact that they feel the U.S. Um, is using some of these smaller territories uh, to kind of uh, support or to, as, a, as they're calling it, an underpin. Uh, for the war against the U.S. and China, whether or not it's a physical war or a war of economics, um, but the challenges and the tension that exist. And so the question is, how is this visit going to reverse some of those thoughts and some of those feelings among those in these territories in this region? Um, and how is the U.S. going to show uh, beyond some of the uh, conversation discussions, uh, some of the visits, uh, some of their verbal communication. What is the U.S. doing physically to show the human rights support that they have for these reasons? And so I think that President Biden and Vice President Harris are going to come back um, after this uh, visit that she's having to figure out how they can truly provide uh, the type of assistance that these territories have voiced uh, during her visit as a result of the protests. We understand that you'll be there for about three days. Uh, we'll continue to look to you for more updates. Thanks a lot, uh, Washington correspondent Maria Bird. A long-awaited loss and damage fund to help the poorest countries that are vulnerable to climate change was approved Sunday as the end of the 27th session of the Conference of the Parties COP27 to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. After days of intense negotiations are stretched into early Sunday morning in Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt, countries were finally able to reach an agreement to establish a funding mechanism which will compensate some of the most vulnerable nations for climate-induced disasters. Here's more on this. Our correspondent, Ola Kassim, reports. The COP to adopt the decision entitled Funding Arrangements for Responding to Loss and Damage Associated with the Adverse Effects of Climate Change, including focus on addressing loss and damage, contained in document FCCC slash CP slash 2022 slash L18, FCCC slash PA slash CMA slash 2022 slash L20. I hear no objections, it's so decided. The moment the breakthrough decision was made in Sharm el Sheikh to address the symptoms of climate change crisis for the most vulnerable, the session approved the text provision to set up a loss and damage fund to help developing countries bear the immediate cost of climate-filled events such as storms and floods. 
But immediately after, Switzerland called for a 30-minute suspension to allow time to study the new text. We have just received the COVID decision before and we did not have time to really study it. So our group will need uh, time for consultation and study it and we will have to postpone with adoption of that decision. When the plenary resumed around 4 a.m. Egyptian time, it was clear there is a pathway for setting up the fund as climate justice, but for some, it did not go far enough. Some are afraid of the transition ahead, of the cost of change. They question the how, not the why. I understand those concerns, but I urge you to acknowledge when you walk out of this room that we have all fallen short in actions to avoid and minimize loss and damage. We should have done much more. Our citizens expect us to lead. That means far more rapidly reduce emissions. That's how you limit climate change, not wait and respond, respond once the climate change has done its devastating effect. The balance of this COP was between desires of the developed world to seek greater mitigation ambition and to expand the list of who is responsible for paying for climate action and the developing world's demands for recognition and support in the face of escalating climate impacts. A lot of compromises were made and the baseline of emissions reductions achieved in Glasgow was barely protected. That is why I am pushing so hard for a climate solidarity pact. A pact in which all countries make an extra effort to reduce emissions this decade in line with 1.5 degree goal. A pact to mobilize, together with international financial institutions and the private sector, financial and technical support for large emerging economies to accelerate their renewable energy transition. COP27, a multilateral process, was impacted by the food and energy crisis gripping the world this year and the ever-increasing impact of climate change on geopolitics. These talks were also billed as the African COP, but sufficient new finance was not generated for vulnerable countries, leaving much to do in 2023, as countries were urged to scale adaptation financing, but were no longer expected to double it. COP27 kicked many of the most controversial decisions on the fund into next year, when a transitional committee will make recommendations for countries to then adopt at the COP28 Climate Summit in November 2023. Ayola Kasim, Channel's Television News. And it's been called a historic outcome, one that benefits the most vulnerable all around the world. Olumide Do is a climate change advocate. He joins me now for more. Hi, Olumide. Thanks for joining me. First, give us your experience of this year's COP compared to the previous ones. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I think this year COP has been a stressful COP because a lot of demand have been put in place. And look, uh, comparing it to COP26, which has been a very, you know, let me call it a little bit of smooth, more than this COP27, which is more stressful because of the achievement and implementation that people are actually looking forward to in different tracks that we see that uh, we will just have some a little bit of ambitious achievement that we see. So for me, I think COP27 is a little bit of long stretch uh, based on the uh, components of what uh, people are demanding for. When I say people, I'm talking about the developing countries that are actually affected by climate change. So your take now, it seems there were so many deals or um, documents signed, loss and damage um, fund, and then the SHIP, Sharm El Sheikh implementation plan. Uh, what, what's your take on, on these results? Yeah, for me, uh, I think uh, the issue to establish a new fund for loss and damage, it's something that, uh, you know, we, we need to critically and, you know, uh, uh, look into because this decision was just taken based on the agitation or the request that developing countries are asking for. But what is going to happen when it comes to the implementation plan in our in the major breakdown that should follow, you know, the, the, the proper financial flow that we need as a developing countries so that we can be able to respond to our loss and damage through this new funding arrangement. Secondly, if you also look at the strong call for, for uh, structural reform of the international financial architecture, also it, it's better for us to also look at it in a way whereby is it going to solve climate issue or is it going to solve development goals issue? So the, the, all the plans and all the achievements actually put us in a shape whereby we need to critically listen to 
the implementation plan? Is it on the fossil fuel issue? Is it on the, uh, the issue of loss and damage financing? We also talk about uh, the issue of mitigation works program. A lot of people have been talking on how do we make sure that uh, a developed country pay for vulnerable countries. But, you know, uh, the, the, the urgency of that loss and damage financing is putting everybody in hope. And this hope is for us to now see that the Sharm el-Sheikh implementation is also going to reflect into the demand that developing countries are asking for. And I also recommend uh, and, and commend uh, the, the, the African group of negotiators for what they have been doing throughout the uh, negotiation process and the plan. So my take is just that how do we translate this so-called uh, 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 loss and damage financial mechanism and even the, the, the technical support they are giving because we need to understand that as well. Is it going to also reflect into implementation or is it just going to be a, the story of 100 billion package they said in 2019? So I would say it's a successful cop to, to, to a lot of people that were able to understand that uh, uh, the, the loss and damage finance is put in place and the, uh, the technical support they are talking about. But we need to look at the African Carbon Market Initiative that was launched as well and the climate risk facility that was also put in front of uh, uh, the presidency to make sure that Africa also have the front or developing countries also understand whether this opportunity is going to be something that's going to be an implementation for us. Also, Lumide, as of last week, we were told that in the first draft, there was no clear detail on stopping the use of fossil fuel. Has that changed? Yes, so uh, the issue of fossil fuel is still on the table. And like I said, when you say you make commitment on, on loss and damage, and the main issue we have been talking about from the Glasgow Park is about the 1.5 degrees uh, centigrade. So. Uh, 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 for now, for me, I think uh, it's, it's a long conversation that we need. To, it's, it's, we need to have a deep conversation on the issue of food safety because we cannot continue to live with this. And a lot of countries are, you know, dancing to the issue of gas. And I remember a campaign during the conference that talks about don't gas Africa. A lot of them are talking about that we, re we require rapid, deep, and sustainable reduction in the global uh, and green gas emission. But as at now. Uh, for us to reduce global net uh, green gas emission by 43 by 20, uh, 2030 relative to the 2019 level, we need a commitment both from the presidency, uh, I'm talking of the COP presidency, we need commitment both from the fossil fuel uh, uh, sector so that they can understand that approving loss and damage financing cannot leave the, the, the fossil fuel conversation uh, behind. Because if you are talking about reducing emission, we are talking about uh, energy assets, yeah, we need to start looking at how do we talk about the global, uh, the Glasgow Park that we already said we want to see 1.5 degrees centigrade. So what's going to happen now when a lot of countries are talking about gas, a lot of countries are talking about uh, uh, building their ambition towards gas, and we're saying that no to fossil fuel. So for me, I, I think uh, it's, it's a cop that we need to retool the understanding of this fossil fuel conversation. And we need to have a seat on the table to understand that this is also part of the achievements from COP27 or after or during COP28. It must be one of our agenda as well. All right. Thank you. Climate change advocate on the Doe. Thanks for joining me on the program. Thank you. Paris's Charles Elysees turn up its holiday spirit Sunday night as the iconic avenue inaugurated its traditional Christmas season glow up amid a worldwide energy crisis. Paris Mayor Anne Hidalgo and Cesar winning actor Tahir Rahim pressed the button to start the illumination, which officials said have been adjusted to consume less electricity. Across much of Europe, lights will be fewer more energy efficient and switched off earlier at night, while shops will be a bit chillier in keeping with government urgings to rein in energy use and in a show of solidarity with households that face soaring utility bills. The so-called sobriety measures are being rolled out at a time when retailers are seeking to draw in shoppers with events and extra bag and window displays eager to resume celebrations that have been disrupted by the pandemic in previous holiday season. It's beautiful. 
beautiful. It's just, oh, it's Christmas. It's Christmas time. I just love it and I wish my children was here and I just, I just can't wait till Christmas. It's beautiful. Yes, you have to have some joy in life and this just brings, I mean, listen, I mean, how many people are here? It's just brought us all together. I think it's, I, I definitely think it's worth it. Yeah, I mean, I saw um, one of the signs said that they're using less electricity this year, which is really cool. Um, and I think they've also closed the road uh, this year, which is incredible. So it's like they're, they're sort of making these, these strides towards, uh, I guess, a greener future, which is good to see. Hope you catch the holiday spirits. That's our program this evening. Thank you for watching. I'm Melissa Walker.